Hello, and welcome to the ninth webinar in our Radiation Safety and Wellness webinar series, Preparing for an X-ray Inspection in an Industrial Setting Based on Ontario Regulations and Best Practices. I'm Lynn McDonald, Liaison Scientist with the Radiation Safety Institute of Canada. I'll be joined today by Lothar Dohler, Radiation Protection Specialist with Radiation Protection Guy and Consultant with the Institute. Mandel Frazier from Power Yoga West in Prince Edward Island will lead us in our wellness segment beginning at 1240 Eastern. Let's take a moment to go over the functionality of the Zoom meeting. We ask that during the presentation portion that the audio and video be from the presenters only. We have found that although you can access the audio through the computer or telephone, the quality of sound tends to be better when listening from a computer. If you have questions arriving from the content, please type them into the chat. As the webinar is only 40 minutes in length and is immediately followed by our wellness session, time may not permit for us to answer all of them during the webinar. The answers will be posted on our website, along with a link to the video recording and a copy of the slides. This can be found under Education Webinars. I will be sending a confirmation of attendance email after the webinar and will include a link to the page with that communication. I will also cover the or include the topics covered and the length of time spent in the webinar, as some people have requested this to send to their professional association. Lastly, I have automatic closed captioning enabled in the slide presentation. If they are being blocked by your Zoom controls, you should be able to select a different way to view the webinar in Zoom, which makes them easier to see. We are happy to have with us here with us today, Lothar Dohler, Radiation Protection Consultant at Radiation Protection Guy. Mr. Dohler has held positions as a radiation safety professional, as an inspector, specialist, and manager. He worked as an X-ray safety inspector and policy analyst for the Ministry of Health in Ontario, and was responsible for direct program delivery of the Ontario Ministry of Labor, or MLL's, radiation protection programs, administering both the radiation protection field service and radiation protection monitoring service programs throughout the province and served as the senior political authority on the full spectrum of radiation protection and safety opinion in the operations division of the MOL. This webinar is an opportunity for us to learn from Lothar's experience as it applies to preparing for an X-ray inspection in an industrial setting. He'll be speaking based on his work within Ontario, specifically to industrial settings with equipment under one mega electron volt. We will start with a brief explanation of the nature of X-rays, jurisdiction in Canada, and the regulations which apply to industrial x-rays in Ontario. Many of the best practices will apply to any industrial setting, but it is necessary to follow the regulatory requirements applicable to your workplace. The presentation will be followed by an interview with Mr. Dohler, which will include topics such as facility organization, the role of the responsible person, worker credentials, and the powers of inspectors. Lothar will take questions from participants as time permits. As this is part of our ongoing radiation protection and wellness webinar series, the radiation protection portion will be followed by a 20 minute wellness session led by Mandel Frazier of Power Yoga West in Prince Edward Island. So I'll start now with the backgrounder and then when that is finished, we'll move on to the interview with Lothar. Energy is the ability to change material in specific ways. Radiation is energy traveling out from a source. In radiation protection, there are two types frequently discussed, particles ejected from unstable radioisotopes and electromagnetic waves produced either by radioisotopes or by human-made devices. If radiation carries enough energy, it can remove electrons from their orbitals in atoms or molecules. Types of radiation which can do this are called ionizing radiation, because they can create ion pairs. Along with possible heating and photochemical effects, exposure to ionizing radiation increases the risk of developing cancer. For more information on this, please see our previous webinar, Health Effects of Exposure to Radiation. Because of these possible health effects, the use of ionizing radiation in the workplace is regulated. X-rays are high energy electromagnetic waves, which can be created by accelerating electrons to high speed and directing them at a target material. 
If the conditions are right, as the electrons slow down or change direction in the material or cause a bound electron to be ejected from its atom, X-ray photons can be produced. X-rays are a form of ionizing radiation due to the high energy of the photons and their ability to interact with material. In Canada, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, or CNSC, regulates particle accelerators which operate at ab above one mega electron volt. An X-ray device accelerates electrons, so if the machine operates in this energy range, it is regulated by the CNSC. Health Canada regulates the import, sale, or lease of devices which produce and emit radiation, other than devices covered under the CNSC's Nuclear Safety and Control Act and Transport Canada's Motor Vehicle Safety Act. Health Canada's Radiation Emitting Devices, or RED Act, and its associated regulation include specifications for devices which emit non-ionizing and ionizing radiation. Some provinces and territories require that equipment used in their jurisdiction meet the requirements of the RED Act and regulation. Health Canada also publishes a number of safety codes and guidelines with respect to the installation and operation of devices which emit radiation. It falls to the provinces and territories to regulate the use of equipment which can produce X-rays under one mega electron volt in workplaces under their jurisdiction. Some choose to adopt Health Canada safety codes into their legislation. In federally regulated workplaces, the use of X-ray equipment falls under the Canada Labour Code, Canada Occupational Health and Safety Regulations. They require that the relevant Health Canada safety codes be followed. In Ontario, the Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development, which we will call MOL, is responsible for worker safety as it pertains to X-rays, the details of which are found in Regulation 861 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Additionally, under the Healing Arts Radiation Protection Act and Regulation 443, the Ministry of Health in Ontario regulates the use of X-ray equipment, the purpose and function of which is the production of X-rays for the irradiation of a human being for therapeutic or diagnostic purposes. So in Ontario, in industrial workplaces, if the X-rays are under one MeV in energy, the regulator is the Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development. In Regulation 861 of the Ontario Occupational Health and Safety Act, you will find requirements for employers and workers with respect to X-ray safety. Most sections apply to all Ontario workplaces with X-ray equipment under one MeV in strength, but Section 15 applies only to X-ray machines used for industrial radiography or industrial fluoroscopy, but does not apply to an X-ray machine to which Section 17 applies. Section 17 applies where an employer is in possession of an X-ray source in which the X-ray source, the object, or the portion of the object being exposed to the X-rays and the detection device are enclosed in a cabinet that, independent of ex existing structures, provides radiation attenuation and prevents access to the X-ray beam. So basically cabinet X-ray equipment. Section 18 applies to analytic X-ray equipment to which section 17 does not apply. And that is primarily used to determine the structure or composition of a sample of a material. So with the background done, we will now move to the interview and question and answer with Lothar. As we do, we wish to remind everyone that the following conversation does not constitute legal advice. You are responsible to follow the legislation in the jurisdiction in which you work. Rather, today is an opportunity for us to learn from Mr. Dohler's wealth of experience and for him to give us points for consideration and best practices. The conversation has not been and is not being vetted by the Ministry of Labour of Ontario. We will direct detailed questions or requests for comment on specific situations to the relevant jurisdictional ministry. So hello Lothar and thank you so much for being here today. I don't know if you want to throw your video on.
We can't hear you at the moment. Technical difficulties here. Hello, sir. There we go. Okay, thank you. I hope you can see me too because... <laughs> yes, we can. That's okay. great. Okay, thanks for inviting me to join the seminar. Yes, and, and we really do appreciate it. Um, so do you mind, not everybody that's here today was here for the health one, like we had done another one, what, about two, three weeks ago. So not everybody was here for that one. So do you mind taking a moment to outline your past work that relates to the topic of a Ministry of Labor inspection? Okay, thank you. Um, as mentioned in that seminar, I was employed by the Ministry of Health as an x-ray safety inspector for seven years, and that gave me a great grounding in x-ray safety and in testing x-ray machines. So many of the job functions were very similar between the two ministries. Um, starting off, you would review a registration, an installation, um, examining the, the plans and forms, um, any acceptance tests or uh, radiation surveys. Um, you would then uh, look to see if, um, you know, you would conduct inspections or investigations, uh, ask for operator qualifications, um, uh, look at protective equipment. Uh, it's important to note that the regulation applies to all workplaces, not just the, the specific machines that are listed in the regulation, but uh, also all medical and dental workplaces as well. Uh, so, you know, in issuing orders, they would be similar to HARP. They would be time-based or even stop use orders. Um, you would follow up with compliance and when necessary, um, actual prosecution if compliance was not followed up with. All right, thanks. So would these inspections be much different than a Ministry of Health inspection? To a certain degree. Um, but um, you have to remember that the HARP Act is really limited to supporting the um, technical, administrative, financial requirements for protecting workers at human diagnostic and therapeutic facilities, whereas the Occupational Health and Safety Act has much broader scope. It has to cover sectors like industrial, construction, mining, and they even have a particular um, regulation covering healthcare and residential facilities. So um, a radiation protection officer, that's what a Ministry of Labor Training and Skills Development inspector is called, uh, specializing in radiation, may ask to seek compliance to the requirements of the act or to any of the regulations, um, they wouldn't necessarily issue orders, but they may refer colleagues to those non-compliance issues discovered. Um, the radiation protection officer is of course trained to uh, seek compliance to the regulation. And basically the entire magnetic, electromagnetic spectrum because Worker radiation safety goes beyond X-ray. Um, we've covered static electric fields, extremely low magnetic fields like power line frequencies, um, lasers, MRI systems, and the entire range of Health Canada Safety Code 6. Okay, so it was, it was very broad, and we're just looking today at one um, section of that, which is X-ray. Right. So our webinar is about preparing for an inspection of x-ray equipment used for non-health care using Regulation 861, X-ray Safety on Ontario's Occupational Health and Safety Act as the example legislation. What types of equipment would fall into this category and in what types of facilities? 
Okay, the specific machines mentioned in the regulation um, are veterinary, which we, I guess, are not covering in this one. Um, cabinet, which can, sorry, industrial, uh, fluoroscopy or, or radiography. Cabinet, which can be industrial, analytical, baggage inspection, gauges, things of that nature. And lastly, um, open beam uh, analytical equipment like diffraction, fluorescence, and crystallography. So in, in terms of the workplaces, um, places like um, a morgue, right? The, right. That, right. How would that fall into? Yeah, since a morgue and um, uh, x-ray examination of people in detention centers are not covered by HARP, that would fall under Ministry of um, Labor, Training and Skills Development. And okay. you have to remember that the regulation applies to all workplaces that have x-ray machines. Uh, HARP facilities are only exempt from certain sections, sections five to eight. Okay. Otherwise, they are covered, the workers in those institutions are covered by this leg legislation as well. And the, the, uh, an RPA radiation protection officer would look into seeing whether warning signs, devices were, were installed properly, locks, barriers. Um, we cover the dissymmetry of all the workers in those institutions. Uh, we also set the limits, the worker exposure limits for those workers. Um, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So who in these, so we're setting aside the HARP, the, the medical, they have separate requirements for who takes care of the program. So mm -hmm. we're going to talk just about industrial, the, the focus of the webinar. Who can be in charge of that x-ray safety program? And what's their designation? Similar to HARP, uh, an employer must designate a person to oversee the safe use of all the x-ray sources at their premise or in their possession. So this designated person um, must show competency either because of acquired knowledge, training or experience um, to exercise safe control of all the machines so, and make sure that the workers operating those machines work, use them in a safe manner. But it's not like in the HARP Act, they say like you have to be a medical doctor, you have to be a chiropractor, things like that. It's just that they have to show that they have the experience necessary for the level of equipment that's being used. Right, in an, in an industrial application, uh, there are specific educational requirements, uh, but otherwise an operator should be properly trained and made aware of the hazard of what they're using. So, so like the section 15 that was mentioned, that requires special training, but like cabinet, um, that it's yes. just, they have to show knowledge. Yes, they, um, they have to have a certificate from the Canadian Standards Board or the modern equivalent, which gives them, it's, it's um, I'm not sure how long the course is, but it's a significant period of time. Right. And what duties fall to this responsible, the designated responsible person? Um, it's similar to the radiation protection officer in a HARP facility. Um, starting off, they're responsible for ensuring that the, the location of the X-ray machine has been reviewed and found acceptable above, by um, Ministry of Labor training and skills development inspector. Um, they are responsible for making sure that the machines are kept in a safe operating condition. The regulation itself does not have specific um, technical tests or any frequencies required, but there is a general requirement of the Occupational Health and Safety Act that all machines must be kept in good condition that applies to any protective equipment supplied to workers as well. Um, they are responsible for ensuring that 
you know, the operator is qualified. That pertains mostly to an industrial environment. Um, they're responsible for ensuring that those workers that are designated as X-ray workers are informed of that designation and are provided with the symmetry. Um, they are also responsible under the healthcare and residential facilities regulation for ensuring that if they support, restrain, position a patient, they are supplied with a personal protective uh, lead equivalent um, apron, glove, and collar where appropriate of at least 0.5 millimeters. Now, it always puzzled me that there was no stated KVP, but uh, uh, that's their requirement. Okay. Uh, they're also, you know, another other parts of that uh, regulation require um, written policy and procedures, training, and specifically in the care of the personal protective equipment, how to use it properly um, and its limitations. So, so with this, just like as we're talking, the use of the term RPO, it really, depending on what facility you are in, that has two different meanings, right? Right. <laughs> I, I know if I'm throwing one. So for people that have the HARP Act regulation involved, which is not our industrial people, that the radiation protection officer's role is like the designated person, correct? Right. right. But then on the Ministry of Labor Training Skills Development, the inspectors that go out are called RPOs. Correct. That's correct. Okay. Right. So just something to be aware of if you're working in a non-healthcare setting, if you're if you shift over to a healthcare setting, that there'll be a shift in that terminology. Right. Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to make sure I was right with that. Um, so who's allowed to operate industrial um, x-ray equipment, like the ones that were mentioned, like 15, uh, 17, 18, under those sections? Only person that has at least level one industrial radiography under the Canadian uh, General Standards Board. Um, there was an old uh, uh, definition of it, but that, of course, is, uh, has been updated since then. There's various colleges um, that offer the course in Ontario. So that's for the one that's industrial radiography fluoroscopy? Right. The for, yeah, x ray industrial radiography. The nuclear industrial radiography is something, a different beast, right? Right. right. And then in terms of cabinet x rays, that doesn't apply, correct? It, Correct, because by its definition, there's a sufficient shielding that the worker doesn't need to have that advanced knowledge. Um, and at the same time, they don't need to wear the symmetry because the, the shielding in that cabinet protects them so they don't exceed the non-worker x-ray limit. And then the other category that's mentioned is the analytical um, do they require, they don't require the industrial radiography x-ray course? No, but no, they, they don't. They need their own training and knowing how to use the equipment. Right? Yes. It's, it's individual to the equipment. You have to show that you have proper training for it. Yes, the, that's a general requirement of the act again. Yes. That they acquaint a worker with the hazard and how to avoid, you know, being... Uh, exposed to that hazard. Okay. So in healthcare in Ontario, x-ray equipment has to go under QA tests. Is it the same for non-healthcare settings? No. Um, as I mentioned before, the regulation itself does not have specific technical tests or frequency, but um, the Occupational Health and Safety Act has general requirements for, for maintaining the equipment in good condition. If an, a radiation protection officer finds a facility uh, fails a lot of the technical tests, and especially on a repeated uh, visit basis, then they may order, uh, issue orders that uh, ask the employer to submit 
QA tests at a certain frequency. Okay. What other tests need to be done on equipment on a regular basis? The only other tests in the regulation um, that have to be, well, it's not really a test, but it's a requirement in the industrial um, uh, part that you have to have a suitable survey meter, uh, which has to be calibrated on a yearly basis. Okay. So we had you had mentioned dosimetry before, and just to clarify, do workers who use x-ray equipment always require dosimetry, and how do you figure out that out as the responsible person? Right. Um, and that, there's, again, confusion between what HARP require, ha, defines as an x-ray worker and what the Ministry of Labor Training and, and Skills Development does. So the definition in regulation 861 says an x-ray worker um, first of all the job must be part of their overall job function um, and they may be exposed to x-rays and they may exceed the non-x-ray worker limit which for example the whole body annual limit is five millisieverts so only if those factors uh, combined define the workers' uh, position, uh, will they be designated as an x-ray worker? So I'll, I'll cover four scenarios where that's possible. First of all, an open beam um, system where an example would be veterinary radiology or fluoroscopy, medical fluoroscopy, um, or an open analytical beam. The second one where, would be where the air kerma rate in the area where the worker works exceeds 0.1 milligray per week. And that would probably be just in an industrial environment. The third example would be if the worker services and repairs x-ray sources. An example of that would be the dental supply companies. The fourth example would be if records of the symmetry results exceed 50% of the limits stated in the, in the schedule in the regulation. So like two and a half millisieverts for whole body. Right. So if, yeah, reports, yeah. if your reports are coming back at that, then you probably yes, should. Yes, but yeah. the, the reports should be coming back at uh, a monthly interval. So hopefully you catch it before yeah, the year. Yeah. Exactly. So what other are, and in terms of keeping records, so what types of records need to be kept um, if you're the responsible person? The uh, dissymmetry results, both um, direct reading, industrial requires direct reading. So every day you use the x-ray machine, you have to record that reading. Um, and, and the general dissymmetry, those have to be kept uh, for a period of uh, at least three years. Um, we're not discussing veterinary, but they have requirements to keep sort of details of every exposure. Um, in healthcare facilities, um, the personal protective equipment uh, should be examined uh, and maintained in a good con condition, inspected for you know damage or deterioration. Now that's mentioned in healthcare facilities. Do you typically see with the industrial applications people wearing lead PPE? No, um, that's why they have a survey meter and that personal dissimetry. Um, uh, the survey meter should give them an indication of what kind of field they're being exposed to, and then either retreat using distance or shielding as the protective um, barrier. Uh, no, in those environments, personal protective equipment is not designed for those environments. Okay. So if an MLTSD minute inspector arrives, what's their legislative power and can the responsible person ask anything of the inspector? Um, their powers are very similar to a harp inspector, but they also have a lot more other powers that exceed 
the powers of a harbor inspector. So starting off, they have the right of entry at any reasonable time. Um, they have the power to inspect the workplace, to do tests. They re can remove samples for testing. They can ask the employer to actually conduct tests of any machine, device, thing, material, or physical agent, which is defined as x-rays in, uh, in the act as well. They can request drawings, uh, specifications, licenses, documents, records, uh, and inspector copy them. They can ask for operator credentials. Um, they can be accompanied by a, a person with expert knowledge if it's an area that are not uh, an expert in. Uh, they can make inquiries of any person at the workplace. Uh, they can ask for a part of or the entire workplace to remain undisturbed for a reasonable portion of time. They can inspect um, records, make, uh, they can inspect radiographs. Um, they can make orders, including stop use orders. Um, beyond that, they actually, there's actually instructions in the act that tells workers that they cannot hinder, obstruct, molest, or interfere with an inspector that is conducting their uh, normal um, job functions. And any person is also encouraged to furnish all means necessary to facilitate the inspector's job. Um, and they shall not knowingly furnish false information. You know, we shouldn't lie to an inspector. So uh, that, you know, that shows that uh, the Ministry of Labor inspector has a lot more power than, than a harp inspector. Um, getting back to the responsible person, they can again, similar to harp, ask for an inspector to show their certificate of appointment. That's what the legislation covers. But of course, they can ask for other information, like how do you appeal an order or what are the options of compliance uh, to an order issue, things of that nature. Now, so the responsible person can ask for the inspector to show the certificate. Um, but you had mentioned before that they can take, the inspector can bring along an expert with professional knowledge. Do they have any type of certification with them or? Does the inspector just vouch for them? The inspector just vouches for them. Okay. Okay. So they 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 may be a, an employee of the Ministry of Training, uh, Labor Training and Skills Development, but they might may not be. So okay. So how does a business get approved to use X-ray equipment in Ontario? Well, they have to, similar to HARP, they have to register and fill out the forms. They're there's a specific website that they can get the registration and then installation approval forms. That's great. We'll put a link to that. Um, you had provided that to us. That I'll put a link to it in the PDF slides. We print them off, put them on our website. So if people are looking for that, I uh, just look in that PDF. So let's say that I've registered. Once I get their certificate of registration for the ministry, how long is it good for? Well, it's good forever. Unless, of course, the information in, in the fields changes, uh, the name of the employer, the address, uh, inventory of sources, that applies to the registration process. Right. Um, so can you do things like move your x-ray equipment or do you have to let them know? No, you definitely have to, to know. Um, along with registration, if you, if you no longer possess a certain source, you have to let them know and if you no longer possess any source then you have to let them know again okay. now switching to uh the plan approval which is the form two um if again any of the information changes you have to let the ministry know but more importantly from a radiation safety uh, perspective if um, 
there's a change in installation, uh, which, you know, of course, uh, involves a move too. But even if you move it to another location within your premise, you have to let them know. Um, if there's a change in the occupancy or use of the adjacent rooms, that means both horizontally and vertically of that x-ray room, you have to let the ministry know. And of course, if there's any change in the shielding, you have to uh, let the ministry know. And only this if there's a possibility of an increase in the exposure of worker to x-rays. If there, if you know, you're changing something from a higher occupancy to a lower occupancy, you don't have to submit that change, but it's the inverse. Let's say you're going from a storage space to a, a day care facility, then definitely you have to let the ministry know of those changes. Um, and that's specific to the machine itself. Peripheral devices like imaging systems, you don't necessarily have to inform of the change. Uh, for example, if you're changing from a film screen to a digital system, uh, most modern digital systems require much less radiation to uh, come up with a, a really good diagnostic image. So that wouldn't require a resubmission. Right. And especially when you're talking about adjacent rooms, if you have um, a business that is running in a place where you don't own the whole property, it's right. something as a responsible person that you have to keep in the back of your mind. If you notice any construction or things going on that might impact the thickness of your walls or exactly. the use of the space, especially above or below, you may not think about that, but if they change the parking garage under you into usable space, then all of a sudden that changes that might require you to put shielding in the floor, for example. Exactly. So, um, do you know, um, I know that you're a specialist in Ontario, but do you know about this registration certificate? It, is it the same process? Or is it different by province by province? It differs from province to province. I mean, a lot of provinces and territories don't even have legislation anymore. Uh, some have revoked the legislation, but where where required, they each have their own specialized process, and that's mostly, you know, you can find that on uh, the relevant um, ministry website. It's usually labor. Yes. Uh, in some cases, it could be others. So um, with all of that, that we, we pretty much covered the interview piece. So I'm going to go to the chat room that some people have dropped some questions in there. And Mandel, I, I hope you don't mind that we're going to answer. Mandel's doing the wellness, but she's used to us by now running a little over into her time. That um, we, I'm going to read the questions out to you. Other people, if you have them, once I'm done with these few that are already typed in, you can either speak them out loud yourself, just raise your hand using the Zoom function, or you can type them in chat and I'll continue to read. So Spencer had asked, you mentioned that MOL does inspect MRI. I asked the MLI, MOL X-ray inspection service about MRI safety questions and was told they do not do that. So who do you go to for the MRI safety? Well, in my day, we used to do that. <laughs> so obviously something has changed. Um, we used to use the uh, American College of Radiologists white paper as the standard for MRI safety in hospitals and clinics if they had, had that, those devices. And, and that so, would be for veterinarian as well. I wonder if it was well, just that that was an x-ray inspector alone and maybe they have separate ones for non-X-ray? Well, to get the straight answer, I would contact the ministry itself. The manager of that section should be able to give the correct yeah, answer. Yeah. And I can check into that too. Well, we're, we're going to write out the answers to the Q&A. So I'll, I'll see if I can get in touch with them and, and clarify that. Um, yeah, we will, um, we include the slide deck uh, as a PDF. We don't put all the notes in it, so that's the conversation that that would be part of the video. What are the requirements for an x-ray service person who has to activate the machine in order to service? Uh, well, I would hope that they are properly trained by their employer themselves. 
if they meet the definition of an x-ray worker, they should also be provided with the symmetry. So if they're entering a hospital, then that RPO should make sure they're wearing their dissymmetry while doing their job functions at the hospital. Or if it was an industrial location and they're, they're checking on that type yes, of equipment, same, the same thing. Same thing. If they meet the definition, then the employer that's letting them on to their workplace has to ensure they comply with all the regulation requirements. Right. And, and like you had said, that there's special training that like people shouldn't be working on extra equipment that do not have the training to do so. That I, I say this in the courses that we teach that the, you can get very mechanically inclined people that, ha, that are very capable of fixing many mechanical things on their own. But when you start getting into the x-ray equipment, some of the things that are there that just look like physical barriers are actually x-ray um, filters, uh, pieces of aluminum and things like that. They may just look like they're trying to keep your fingers out, but they are there to um, attenuate the beam, to collimate the beam, and removing that would increase the risk to people using the equipment. So right. unless, even though you're good with mechanics and you're good with electricity, Unless you're trained to actually work on the x-ray equipment, you should not be doing so. Perfect. So are there any other questions from the people here today or comments? So not hearing any. Lothar, are there any last minute uh, or last comments you'd make for people who are becoming the responsible person? in terms of being organized or mindset or anything like that? Well, similar to what I mentioned in the last uh, seminar, just um, have all your paperwork organized uh, and keep them either in a hard copy file or a virtual file, starting off with the reg re uh, registration and, and location approval forms, the stamp drawings from the ministry, uh, where required, the operator qualifications, any records of training, the ministry, even though not required um, by the, the regulation, it'd be great to see um, this person, this operator was trained uh, in x-ray, in general x-ray safety and specific use of this machine on this date. Um, and that should be refreshed every so often. Uh, any dissymmetry records should also be kept. Uh, copies of the previous inspection. So they, as a reminder of possible non-compliance issues they encountered back then. Um, that's pretty well it. So, and so when you showed up as an inspector, when you, um, what's the type of thing that you would find impressive versus something like, you wanted to see all that kind of organized and people who just put their hands on things? Yes. I mean, when you walk into a facility, you have a general impression of how well it's run and, and, uh, and organized. So it's, it was always refreshing to, first of all, to know that uh, there were a lot of people that resented us showing up unannounced, but that is in the power of an inspector. You're, you're there to assess the facility at that point in time. So, um, you know, people that welcomed us were aware of that. And they were usually ones that had better organizational capabilities. Yeah. Yeah. And, and with that, we just, again, appreciate, really appreciate having you here. And uh, people, please know that at the Institute, we are uh, not for profit. Um, we do provide free information to the public. So if you have any further questions, you can always write us at info at radiationsafety.ca or give us a call at 1-800-263-5803. If it's a quick question that we can answer, um, that's free. We also do larger consulting projects and training if either of those are of interest. And um, this is actually our last webinar before we take a break for the summer. So we appreciate everybody being here. And with that, we'll say goodbye to Lothar. Thanks again. Um, hopefully you'll come back and do another one with us in the fall. Maybe we can do a veterinary or something. Yeah, be great. <laughs> and um, so we're going to now move to our wellness portion. Mandel, are you out there? I am, yeah. Okay, so how's PEI's weather today? 
It is a lovely day on PEI. It's raining here in Ontario. Lothar, what about where you're at? Yes, we had showers coming in earlier. Yeah, we really needed it. So, so Lothar, we'll, we'll see you. We're going to Thank let Mandel take over with the stretching. And uh, we have a new uh, location today. <laughs> I'm at home today, so I sent the kids outside. Uh, there might be a little bit of noise, so I apologize. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to mute and stop my video and spot like you. And again, thanks everyone who can. We understand some people will have to leave at the top of the hour, but uh, we appreciate you being here um, as long as you could. We'll let you take over, Mandel. Okay, perfect. Um, so. You can stay seated in your chair, but I just want you to make sure you have just a little bit of space so that you're able to come up to stand. That's about all the space you need there. But we are gonna start seated, and I just want you to kind of scoot your seat bones a little bit closer towards the edge of the chair. And as you take your next breath in, I want you to just kind of think about yourself just sitting a little bit taller. Feel the shoulders draw back and away from the ears, and you just wanna let the hands fall softly on your thighs. Go ahead, close your eyes. And all I want you to do here is just kind of do a little internal scan. So notice what's going on inside the body. Maybe that's physical. So maybe there's an injury that you're nursing or maybe there's some stress or tension that's causing the shoulders to hunch up or, or the spine to kind of be out of alignment. Maybe it's more emotional, so maybe there's some areas in the body that kind of might be holding on to some negative emotion or vice versa. Maybe it's positive emotion. Maybe everything's feeling really well in the body, physically and emotionally. But just taking the time to do a little scan and just it really it's checking in with yourself. So acknowledging what's going on within your body. One of kind of the most important key component I think of yoga practice is to just allow ourselves to sit within ourselves. So to just be present within ourselves, which is something we don't typically allow ourselves to do a whole, whole lot of. And in this, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just a little scan, a little check-in. And then I want you to begin to think about your breath. Noticing how you breathe. Is it through the mouth? Is it through the nose? When you breathe, do you feel your chest rise and fall? Do you feel your belly rise and fall? Is there some movement in the shoulders as you do that? But I want you to see if you can now shift your breath to more of a deeper belly breath. So as you take your next breath in, see if you can start to breathe in through the nostrils. And as you breathe in, you'll start to feel your chest lift. But see if you can kind of push the breath deeper into the belly so you feel your breath, or your belly, sorry, rise as well with the breath in. So just really a nice, full, deep breath in. And then as you breathe out, it's going to leave the belly, the breath, leave the chest, the lungs, leave the throat. And if it feels comfortable, back out through the nostrils. And just seeing if you can create just now this nice ebb and flow of the inhale breath and the exhale breath. Inhale leading to the exhale, exhale leading into the inhale. There's no hesitations. Nice, fluid, natural breath.
And just begin to set your feet a little bit firmer into the earth here. As you take your next breath in, you're going to take your arms up and overhead. Now, as you breathe out, you're going to press into the feet. You're going to come to stand. And as you come to stand, you're going to take your arms and just kind of reach them in behind so you open up through your chest. Now, you'll take the arms up and overhead as you breathe in. As you breathe out, you're going to take your left hand along the side of your body and you'll bring your right arm off towards the left side of the room. Little side body stretch here. Come back up to center on the inhale breath. So left arm reaching back up towards the ceiling. Switching sides as you exhale. So right hand down, left arm reaches off towards the right. Nice deep breath in. You're going to stay for your breath out. Inhale, reach both arms back up and overhead. As you exhale, you're just going to take your arms along the sides of your body. You're going to come back to your chair sitting. Okay, nice and rooted through your seat bones. Sit tall, take a deep breath in, reach your arms up and overhead. Now, as you breathe out, you're going to draw your hands to heart center. You're going to lean your chest forward. From here, you're just going to start to pivot the chest off towards the right. Once you have that, you're going to take your left elbow and land it to the inside of the left thigh. We're going to stay here for a couple of breaths. Great here, if that feels good. If you want to go a little bit deeper, you can take that top hand up towards the ceiling, and you can take that bottom hand down towards the floor. Try to keep the crown of the head reaching out so spine is nice and long. Breathe in. If the arms are wide, bring them back towards your heart center as you breathe out. Square the chest back off and then lift up so the spine is neutral. Take a nice deep breath in, reach your arms up and overhead. As you breathe out, you're going to take your hands to heart center. Again, you're going to lean forward. This time, chest is coming off towards the left. You're going to take right elbow to the inside of right thigh. And then you're just going to kind of push the elbow into the thigh as the thigh pushes back into the elbow to create that rotation through the spine. Again, you have the opportunity to stay here, or if you want to take that top hand up towards the ceiling, and bottom hand down towards the floor, you can do that. Keep that right leg nice and active. One more breath in. As you breathe out, bring your hands back towards your heart. Square the chest off and then come up right with the spine. Nice deep breath in, reach your arms up and overhead. As you breathe out, you're just going to let your belly rest right on top of your thighs. You're going to let your arms become heavy so they hang down towards the floor. And then go ahead, just let your head become heavy. Now we're just going to take our hands towards the back of that head for a little extra tuck here. You're going to take your chin now a little bit closer towards your chest so you feel the neck open up. Okay, now nice and slow, as you breathe in, you're going to come up, take your time, keep your hands as they are, take the spine upright, now take your elbows out, and then just begin to lean your head back into your hands. Nice counter pose, so feeling the front body open up, the chest, the heart, front of the shoulders. Take a nice deep breath in. As you breathe out, come back to a neutral spine. Let your arms just fall heavy to the sides of the body. You're going to take your hands now, gather onto either that right knee or even in behind the thigh, whatever you're most comfortable with there. And you'll just kind of tuck that knee in towards the belly. Little squeeze, sit up tall. Take a nice deep breath in. 
Now, as you breathe out, you're gonna take that foot straight out. Keep the leg nice and active, so flex the foot, take an inhale. As you exhale, draw the knee back in towards the chest. One more time, inhale, extend the leg. Exhale, knee comes back in towards the chest. Now you're gonna take that right foot on top of left thigh. You're gonna let the knee open up. Depending on the hip flexibility, it might not be a whole lot. Again, stay nice and tall. Keep that right foot flexed. You can stay right here, or it might feel accessible to even hinge from the hips a little bit here. You should feel a little tug in that right hip. Take a nice deep breath in. You're going to stay for your breath out. Slowly take your time as you rise back up. Inhale. You're going to gather that right knee back in towards your chest. Now you're going to take the leg out long. You're going to take your heel down to the floor. You might even scoot your seat bones a little bit closer towards the edge of your mat. Take an inhale. Sweep your arms up and overhead. Now as you exhale, you're just going to begin to fold towards that right leg. And again, it might be a little, it might be a lot, depending on hamstring flexibility this time. But see if you can keep driving your right heel down into the floor. Keeping that leg nice and active, breathe in. You're gonna stay here, breathe out. Take your time as you slowly come on up, inhale. Take a bend back into that right knee as you exit. Nice reach of the arms up, take an inhale breath. As you exhale, bow forward. Just let the chest fall heavy towards the floor. Inhale, you're gonna come back up, arms reaching up and overhead. As you exhale, draw your hands to heart center. Second side, so now we're gonna take a hold of that left knee, so either around the knee or in behind the thigh, whatever you feel most comfortable with there. And then just see if you can tug that knee a little bit closer into the belly. Sit tall, breathe in. Stay, breathe out. Now just two times. So as you inhale, you're gonna kick that left foot straight forward. And hold on, you might even release. As you exhale, draw the knee back in towards the chest. One more time, inhale. And exhale. Now you're going to take that left foot on top of your right thigh. Again, keep that foot flexed. That's going to protect knee joint. Let that knee joint or knee open up. Sit tall. And then stay put right here. Or if you feel like it's accessible, again, you might lean forward. Continue to breathe. On your next inhale, come on up. Gather that left knee back in towards the chest. Extend the left leg long, and then you'll just place that heel onto the floor. Keep that leg nice and active, so really glam down through the heel. Take an inhale, reach your arms up and overhead. As you exhale, forward. And again, a little or a lot. But breathe. Feel the breath move into the lungs, into the belly. Exhale breath matches the inhale breath. So same length. Really simple, easy way to calm the nervous system is just slowing the pace of the breath down. On your next inhale breath, take your time as you lift the chest back up. Take a bend back into that knee, so both feet firmly pressing into the ground. One more time, we're going to take the arms up and overhead. As you breathe out, you're just going to fold. Take your time as you let your chest melt on top of the thighs. Heavy comes heavy. On your next inhale, come all the way up. Big reach of the arms. As you exhale, draw your hands to heart center. Good. Now I just want you to get comfortable in your chair. So just 
Move the seat bones back, lean back as much as you want. Let the body become nice and relaxed. Relax the shoulders. Feel the back body that's touching the chair there, relax. Close the eyes down. Maybe even just let the breath go. Let the breath just naturally flow in and out without any conscious thought. We're going to stay here for a few moments and we're going to come into a 31 point meditation. So I'm just going to mention certain areas of the body and all I want you to do is bring awareness to that space. And then as soon as you bring awareness to it, just ask, it, ask that space to relax. And then we'll move on to the next. So we're going to start to that space right in between the eyebrows. So the center between the eyebrows. That's where we'll start. And I'm just going to name the rest of those spaces. Again, bring awareness to that space. Ask it to relax. And then we'll move on. Center between the eyebrows. Base of the throat. Right shoulder joint. Right elbow joint right wrist joint, tip of the right thumb, tip of the right index finger, tip of the right second finger, tip of the right fourth finger, tip of the right small finger, right wrist joint, right elbow joint, right shoulder joint, base of the throat, left shoulder joint, left elbow joint, left wrist joint, tip of the left thumb, tip of the left index finger, Tip of the left second finger. Tip of the left fourth, fourth finger. Tip of the left small finger. Left wrist joint. Left elbow joint. Left shoulder joint. Base of the throat. Center of the right chest, heart center, center of the left chest, heart center. Now just bringing awareness to the whole body, asking your whole body to relax here. Now, just starting to feel a little stirring of energy once again, and maybe that means moving fingers and toes, deepening the breath, rotating wrists, ankles, maybe even moving the shoulders around a little bit. On your next inhale breath, you're going to take a nice deep reach of the arms up and overhead. Maybe even draw the chest up a little bit, gaze up a little bit. Sit just a little bit taller. Take in all that space. Breathe in one more time here. As you breathe out, you're going to gather that energy towards your heart center. And just at the end of every yoga class, we finish with a namaste. So namaste. Take care, everyone. 
So thank you, Mendel, for sharing these practices with us, not only today, but through the rest of the webinar series. Yes, and, they're enjoyable. Yeah, like I said, we're going to pause now for summer, and I don't know what the fall will look like, but uh, we do appreciate that you've been here with us for, I think, eight of the nine webinars. So thanks again. Thank you. And thanks to everyone that was able to stay for the full time. And I will send that email out. It's probably going to be um, with the holiday on Friday. It's probably Monday or Tuesday next week. And um, thanks again for those. I know there's some that come every, every one of our webinars or as many as they can. And we do appreciate whether you've been here just for one or if you've been here for many. And uh, so have a great long weekend, everyone. And we'll see you again, hopefully in the fall.